Hello, my name is Jorb. I love film, and I took those photos on this, the Kodak Ektar H35N. It is a modern $60 camera with almost no settings. You cannot adjust focus, you cannot adjust your exposure. The only thing you can really do is choose your film and turn the flash on or off. I have nice SLRs with good lenses, I have a few of the cult classic compact cameras, and still, I take more photos and have more fun with this. Over the last two years, I've shot maybe, I don't know, dozens <laughs> of roles, trips, concerts, even just regular nights out, any time where I might have wanted to keep a memory. And some of my favorite shots have come from that, all because I decided to throw this a cheap piece of plastic in my pocket before I went out the door. And one of its strongest selling points, it makes shooting film cheaper by taking portrait orientation half frame shots so you get twice as many photos on every roll. It might not seem like a huge deal, but while rolls of film and getting them developed are more expensive than it's ever been, I think that's a really strong argument. You're getting twice the amount of photos for the same price in film. I think that really is important. And that's not just good value. It lets you take more risks. It lets you have more fun. You're taking shots you wouldn't have taken otherwise. And I think that makes this a really, really special experience. And I really think anybody who's getting into film photography now is probably better off starting with this than almost anything else. So to that end, I'm going to show you hands on exactly how to use it. And assuming beginners are most of the people uh, watching, I'll be weaving it in. I'll be weaving in a sort of film photography primer the whole time. I want this video to be something a beginner can sit down and watch, walk away without any questions totally ready to take this camera and make some memories. So there you go. You'll see tons of examples. Uh, use the chapters if you just need something specific or you have a camera already and want to hear somebody tell you how this works or that works. Uh, comment once you're done to let me know how I did. Let's start with a closer look. One thing before we get too deep, there are two versions of this camera, the original H35 and the H35N, which is a little bit newer. Fundamentally, they end up being the same experience for the most part. Anything I really liked about either of them is present on both of them. You know what I mean? There are a few small improvements. There's a glass lens on the H35N. I notice a difference there. It adds on top here that uh, socket for a cable release and a tripod, uh, which gives you the chance to expo experiment with long exposures. I think it's cool. The viewfinder is actually portrait orientation instead of just being a masked uh, full frame. This is threaded for lens filters in front of the lens. You gain the star filter. Uh, and they changed some things to be a little bit more durable, like the film wonder. But in general, I don't consider these to be so different of an experience that talking about one won't help you learn about the other. So with that in mind, I'm just going to demonstrate on the H35N. I think if you haven't bought one yet, and that $20 difference isn't make or break for you, that then the glass lens and the viewfinder that's less confusing is, is honestly probably worth it. Otherwise, using them is more or less the same experience. There's not that much to know. Your shutter button's on top. You wind here in the bottom left. On the front is where you turn the flash on by rotating the entire lens. I don't have a battery in here right now, but you put a AAA battery in on the bottom. Now with a battery, once you turn this ring around the lens on, that red light will tell you that it's ready to use the flash. Also on the front is this variable star filter, which will have an effect on point lights, on highlights, uh, and make it look like straight lines, like a starburst. I'll show you some examples of that. I don't use it that often, but once in a while you get a cool result. Not really anything to say about the viewfinder. You look through it, it's optical. It is not showing you what's directly through the lens, just something that people might not understand. When you're using a camera like this, you can have your fingers right in front of the lens here and have no problem looking straight through the viewfinder because the viewfinder isn't actually showing you what's going through the lens. So important to remember, it's vertically oriented, uh, just like just like your uh, final picture will be vertically. If we want to put the film in, we pop this lever down on the right side, and that lets us open the door. Not a lot going on in here. We can see our take-up spool that our winder is directly attached to. Super simple. You can see this is masked for our half frame. It's a vertical-oriented, uh, or a portrait, I guess, photo. And on the right is the chamber for our film. I have this roll of film uh, that I'm never going to develop. I just use it for testing stuff. Uh, it's 24 exposures. You can use 36 exposures, and I would recommend you buy that because you get so much more bang for your buck if you're paying per development, especially when you get twice as many uh, shots per length of film here. But as far as loading film, and let's just look at the canister for a sec. This is the leader, the part that's cut to sort of let you slot this into your camera. And because film is sensitive to light, you're never going to be able to develop an image on this section of the film. 
and anything I continue to pull out of the canister also will never be able to really reproduce an image because right now it's getting blasted with way more light that's not controlled or corrected in any way uh, like a lens would. And so anything you unroll from this is not going to be able to keep an image. Uh, you can roll things back in like this, but don't pull too much out at the beginning, but also don't be afraid to pull it out because that's how you need to load the camera. So what I do on the left side, make sure this is in focus. On the left side here, you can see our winders connected to our take-up spool. And once I see that slot, um, that's where I leave it. You just drop the canister right in there and then pull a little bit more of this film leader out and slot it into that side of the take-up spool. And then wind it up, wind it up, wind it up, wind it up. You'll see it catch on these two gears, these two sprockets uh, in the middle of the frame. You'll feel it pull tight. Okay, and once I'm confident that it is on the take-up spool good, and I see it on both these sprockets, I'll close it, finish winding, and then eventually it'll stop, and that's your first frame. Now you'll notice, as you wind, you'll pull it one, two, maybe three times, it'll get stuck, you can't move the winder anymore, and then pressing in, pressing in your shutter button will take the photo. Same thing with flash, turn that ring around the lens, wait for the red light to be as bright as it's going to get, and then... Probably couldn't see that. <laughs> the flash will go. You kind of hear it charge up too. But I'm going to just, like I said, this is a roll of film that I'm never going to develop, so I'm not worried about doing this. I'm just going to crank through and simulate <laughs> when you finish a full roll. So once you're at the end of the roll, you'll notice it'll get harder and eventually you won't be able to turn this winder anymore. Because think about what we set up, right? We're just trying to pull more film out of the canister and it's the end. It's like you're pulling on a string that doesn't have any more give to go. So for me, on that 24 exposure roll, or as marketed, 24 exposure roll. Can you see that? Maybe not. <laughs> I'm on 52, so sometimes it's not exactly what you'd expect. That happens, I think, even more with 36 exposure rolls. That's based on the film, where you got it, how you wound it in the beginning, all sorts of stuff. But to get the film out, and remember it's sensitive to light, right? Right now, all the images we took are wound up on this left side. If I were just to open the door, pull it out, and have that film be exposed to the light, I would ruin all those images we already took. So we need to wind it back into the canister before I take it out. So you need to pry this lever open very carefully. I hardly have any fingernails. And if you just try and wind it back, you're not going to be able to. You need to hit this release button on the left which will let the take-up spool turn freely. And then you wind as long as you can, and you'll feel a difference in the tension near the end. Let me do... So right there at the end, you can feel it come off the take-up spool, and you can check by winding the take-up spool over and over. Okay, so it's not on the take-up spool anymore. So you could keep winding, keep winding, or pop it open and see that the leader's in there. But now I'll show you this last little bit. That's what's happening when you turn this lever, winding it safely back in the cartridge. And so now, and so now all the latent images, the images that are represented on this film are safe and sound in this canister where no light is going to get in uh, and ruin the shots you took. And at this point, same as the beginning, if you pulled that film all the way out, you'd ruin all your exposures. It's not until it gets developed that you get negatives. This is what I get back from the lab. They put them in these nice, uh, I don't know, Pokemon card binders. <laughs> and you can see that they're partially translucent negative image. And one last time, that is not what's in this canister right now that I just finished uh, taking shots and pulling out of my camera. You won't be able to actually reproduce an image until it gets developed. So there's your hands-on. There's your guided tour. Really, the most important thing is knowing uh, how to handle the film, and that as soon as it's out of the canister in the open daylight, it's not something that can reproduce an image. And after you've taken your images, you've finished your roll, you need to make sure it's back in the canister uh, before you pull it out and take it to your lab. But like I said, as far as using the camera, if it's dark, use the flash. Hold still no matter what, uh, and you'll be good to go. Not bad at all, right? Let's move on to talking about... So, 
because the H35 doesn't really give us any settings to change, we can't really account for different lighting situations. So the film you choose ends up mattering a lot in terms of not just how your final shot will look, but also how effectively it can get captured on film at all. Different film stocks will have differences in the way they reproduce an image in terms of their color, how much grain is present, the dynamic range, all sorts of things that will make you choose one over another. But the most important thing to know when you're choosing a film stock is how sensitive to light it is. If you take a photo that lets in too much light, that's overexposure, which I don't have any examples of <laughs> on this camera, but not enough light, that's underexposure. And I have tons of examples of underexposure on this camera. With film photography, underexposure is a lot worse than overexposure. And with the Ektar, underexposure is a lot more common. Uh, an underexposed shot will have no detail in the shadows, nothing you can even try to pull up in digital end editing. There wasn't enough light to sort of activate, so to speak, that grain. Uh, I do have to acknowledge some of the examples you've seen off the side here are honestly really, really cool. <laughs> and even if I might have envisioned the result differently, or, or I would have wanted you know, more detail in what turned out to be just deep shadow, these are interesting shots. So don't be too shy about taking a photo, even if you think your instinct is telling you it might be too dark. Sometimes the highlights really, really become the only subject and the photo turns out just right. Anyway, in digital photography, none of that is nearly as big of a deal. Your camera sensitivity to light, it's ISO, is something you can control. You can turn it up or down to account for different lighting situations and you can see on the screen what you're about to get. With film, because the sensitivity of a given film stock is the same for the whole roll, it's not something we can change. Other than loading a different roll of film into your camera, there's nothing you can do. You have to make the choice based on the lighting situations you sort of expect to be shooting the roll in. Uh, and you want it to be not too sensitive for flash to be overblown, but sensitive enough to handle some indoor shots. And any film stock will tell you exactly how sensitive to light it is. It'll have a number attached to it, an ISO. A higher number is more sensitive to light, and a lower number is less sensitive to light. The two most common ISOs for modern mass market films are going to be 200 and 400 ISO. And luckily, those are the exact two values I would recommend you use for the H35. That's sort of the technical part. Get something at two or 400 ISO, uh, but even that doesn't really narrow it down. Even if we're just talking color film, if you go on b &H Photo, filter it down to single rolls of 36 exposure film that is at 200 or 400 ISO, there's like 30 options. And they all vary in price, and they all have different descriptions, and they all have these numbers and attributes that, that will mean nothing to a beginner. So my advice to a beginner is don't worry about it yet. Start with cheaper, big name stuff, Kodak Gold, Ultra Max, the Fuji 2 and 400. Try a few rolls of them, and once you've got a baseline, then expand and maybe try some other stuff. Maybe you want less grains, you can get something like Portra 400, which is the sort of premium de facto standard. Uh, or maybe you want to get weirder. Maybe you want to try something more experimental. Lomography has a bunch of color shifted options, turquoise, purple, and uh, metropolis that might really, really excite you, might really, really work for the sort of things you're trying to capture. But really to start, your first few rolls, get a three pack of Fuji from Walmart, buy some Ultramax at Walgreens, get a baseline and then sort of grow out of there, grow from there. So now that you've shot your film and you've wound it safely back in the canister, what about getting it developed? What about seeing the final results? I go to a local lab. I have a local lab that I love and I trust, and they will develop and scan the results to a flash drive without having to print them for about $10 a roll. And I don't live in a huge city. I live in the sleepy Midwest. So chances are you also have a local lab. Uh, there will be options for you there. I think at first, maybe you want prints to have them physically, but when you're not sure how the results are going to turn out, just get them scanned. And if you like any in particular, get those printed after the fact. Anyway, if you don't have a local lab, there are online places you can ship to that to develop. I've never done that, so I don't have any recommendations. But see what people are saying online and, and go based on that. Try based on that. One small note, there are different chemistries, different processes for developing film. And they're all called something different. But C41 is the most common. My regular lab will only develop C41. Not E6, not ECN2, not uh, professional black and white, whatever. My advice is, when you're developing your first roll of Ultramax or Fuji 2 or 400, ask your local lab what they can do. Uh, and if their film prices are good, just buy it from them. But that's really it. I think you're ready now. You know everything you need to know to take this camera and make some memories. And I've had such a great time doing it. I hope you do too. So there you go. My name's Jorb. I love film. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.